Hi, I'm Kevin Harrington. I'm Samba Bachili. Nina Vaca, Chief Executive Officer of Pinnacle Group. An original shark from the hit TV show Shark Tank. The CEO of ADS Group. The largest Latina-owned workforce solutions in America. I first identified myself as an entrepreneur when I was 15 years old. My mother and father immigrated here with a suitcase and a dream. I had a front row seat to entrepreneurship. I am living proof of what is possible in this country. Today, the marketplace is, is very tough. The challenge for African market today is its access to capital. The number one reason why we can't scale as entrepreneurs is access to capital. What makes GLOW so different and so powerful is the access to experts, gurus, mentors, coaches, financiers, venture people, money. When I started my business, I immediately went to engage with different communities, different platforms. Glow makes that experience digital. A digital platform makes it so much faster and so much easier for you to meet like-minded people. The financial platform that Glow have that make Glow unique. Glow is about commerce, Glow is about community, and Glow is about having access to capital. Glow is an asset to every entrepreneur in this country and globally. It's, it's about helping you take your business, your idea, to the next step. Hi there, and welcome to Business Acceleration 2.0. It's the show where leaders go to grow. I'm the host, Michelle lemons Basenti, and I'm thrilled that you could be here with me today. I want to thank our sponsors, the Business Finishing School, which is a uh, online program to help entrepreneurs scale their business, grow their business, make their business more sustainable, and to be able to sell their business if they ever wanted to sell it. It's also brought to you by the Global Leaders Organization. GLOW, as we call it, is a membership organization that's made for the entrepreneur. It helps to bring community for the entrepreneur. It brings a platform so that you can buy and sell products and services from one another. And it also has a capital component. So if you're looking to raise capital, whether it be debt or equity, GLOW can assist in doing so. Um, today, we have a very special guest, Mr. Sam Wiley. He's a legend. He's a you know a past billionaire multiple times with three different businesses. He has broken up monopolies such as AT and T. He was the one who did it. He paved the road for the internet, actually, and then he ended up selling his business to AT and T after he'd broken it up as a monopoly. He is quite the icon. So, without further ado, I want to welcome Mr. Sam Wiley. Sam, thank you for joining us today. Hi, Sam. Hi, Michelle. <laughs> How are you? Well, fine. <laughs> That's awesome. That's perfect. That's great. Um, you know, we've got a couple of things in common. Not only are we both entrepreneurs, but I went to Louisiana Tech as well. Oh, you went to Louisiana Tech. Hey, you're a bulldog. <laughs> That's right. I was a I was a um, a DG at at. Delta Gamma. Delta Gamma. <laughs> oh, Delta Gamma. Yeah, well, I was like a, a yeah, and uh, but no, um, wait, I was a KD. I forgot. My daughter was a DG. I was a KD. Oh, yeah, Kappa Delta. That's my, great. My mom was Kappa Delta, but she was down at OSU. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. But I love, I love, I love Louisiana Tech when I was there. It was just, and actually, I had already signed up for LSU. I had my dorm. I had everything there. I was fully sure I was going to LSU, and then, uh, uh, and so, but I worked the summer at LSU. I worked in the House of Representatives. My dad had backed the winning governor, and he had gotten me a job as a head page in the, in the House of Representatives. So I spent a summer working there and decided that, uh, what job I wanted to have. Uh, I wanted, what I wanted to do was be governor of Louisiana, but, you know, you can't do that. You got to wait till you're 36. So, uh. Well, I think your middle name is perseverance and determination, and you you showed that very early on in your very first company. Is that something that you were born with, having determination uh, and perseverance? I don't know exactly how I was born with it. I know we, uh, 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 but um, I, I think I grew up around it. I could I could see it in the uh, in the work and the families of you know my parents and my uncles and my aunts and the neighbors it was kind of the blessing of being in 
small town, you know, uh, farming and old patch country, you you see lots of uh, lots of different ways to make a living. <laughs> right, and you're also a risk taker. Ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> a little bit about risk. And actually, that was partly because uh, uh, my parents had three different businesses. It's a very small town. You know, you search the census number today, and you see 2,900 people. I don't think that's fair because in Delhi High School, we had all 12 grades, and we uh, <clears throat> uh, we had about, back then, the census used to give us enough farming territory around Delhi, so it counted the people that came in on the school buses. So we had over five or six, we had five or six thousand there in, in what was officially called Delhi. So anyway, I, I learned it in the community. And my parents, uh, we were already into the information age. The information age being, we had the Delhi Dispatch Weekly newspaper, but also we had the Western Union Telegraph Agency. And uh, when you go to the Computer History Museum in Silicon Valley today, the first device they show you in the history of computing is the telegraph. Hmm. So we sent telegrams. Today, uh, all of us, you know, with Laurie and Lisa, Evan, we all carry around a little iPhone 12. And we could text to one another. But uh, when I was a kid, uh, you, you could text. I mean, it was a big deal to go send a telegram. And, you had to work hard to uh, make it short and quick and mean something because it cost you uh, by every word and every letter or every number was was a word. So that, that but also that was part of my training was helping people get their telegram down to something where it only cost them a dollar or a dollar and a half. Do you think, Sam, that's the reason you got into computing? from the telegraph? Did that have a basis for you moving into the computer and engineering? I think that a lot, I think the, that along with a lot of other things, it was a, in a small town, my folks needed not only the telegraph business and the newspaper business, they needed an insurance agency. So we had the Charles J. Wiley. My dad was Charles. Yeah, well, one of the, in, in, in making the newspaper, printing the newspaper, you had to have the column, all the words had to be lined up into you know, six columns across the plane and uh, the page. And uh, IBM made a little machine that went on by mom's electric typewriter. So when she keyed in the text, it would come out with little, you know, even columns for the newspapers that we could put on the offset press to print. So uh, um, that IBM salesman that came to, to talk to us and sell us and train us on it, he was really, really smart. He dressed well. He drove a Cadillac. I thought, hey, <laughs> this must be a good company to work for. <laughs> yeah, well, it was, yeah, they had a very early, and they started us back with binary arithmetic and the, the electric switch is either on or off. And here's how you do binary numbers and you turn them into ABCDs oh. or one, two, three, fours. And the, then you, then they, we, we had a step by step and we had a, Ultimately, we had a machine we could write a program for, yeah. and you could you could. Write, I remember writing a payroll uh, program where you, the employee, you could take the employees' hours they had worked in the factory, mm -hmm. and uh, the hourly rate, and you could calculate what the paycheck ought to do, and then across the businesses you could allocate it to the different cost centers. So that was a program I wrote. What was for? It was then called the IBM 650, which was. Um, uh, the low cost computer then it cost less than a million dollars. <laughs> so yeah, I was just about yeah, I was just about to say that you you are when I say risk taker, you saw a gap in the industry and said, I think I can fill that gap, but it would require a computer. And the computers were going for a million dollars, three million dollars, and you took that risk to buy the computer because you saw the opportunity, right? Well, I, I, saw, I saw an opportunity, yeah, that was created by the evolution of technology, but also by the evolution of, you know, the, the busting up of the IBM monopoly. Uh, meant that the industry came, 
became IBM and the Seven Dwarfs. And uh, so uh, yeah, there, were, there were, it was more than one thing going on that, you know, created an opportunity for me. Well, was that scary for you to think about taking out a loan or trying to find the money for something that was so expensive back then? I think you paid $600,000 for the computer. Well, yeah, it wasn't scary to me. I mean, I thought it was fun. I mean, I knew it, I knew it was risk, but um, we're taking a risk, you know, we had, if you're, you got farmland, you take a risk when you plant in a spring, you borrow money, you know, to grow it, you work at it, you know, and, and, and you don't harvest it to the fall. And, and you don't know what the price of cotton is going to be. How much of the price of soybeans is going to be? You don't know. I mean, it's a risky world. And um, so uh, I learned about risk all around me growing up. And my dad had the insurance agency. Uh, uh, you might say he, the, ins the property insurance company is risk reduction. It's a, if your house burns down, you know, or if uh, your, your car wrecks, you know, you got to, that's what a property insurance does, you know. So you also talk about making sure whatever you're doing, you love, right? That you love what you're doing. Were you ever in businesses that you got into that you didn't love and then you got out of them? Well, some of them I didn't understand very well, and it took a lot of work to learn to love them, you know, <laughs> but, but, uh, but I, uh, there are always good people who can explain to me, you know, what they're doing and what this, their unit is doing, what, what, what the team is doing. And um, I, I grew up being part of a team, you know, I was, a, I had good, I had a good coach and, you know, I was no, I was nose guard on defense, but I, I had a bunch of linemen and some good, good defensive head backs behind me. I was the offensive, you know, lineman. But so just, you know, doing the sports was good training. Yeah, sports is great training, actually. Well, speaking about having really good people around you, you also talk in your book about making sure that you hire good people and then get out of the way, let them do their job. And as an entrepreneur, that's hard to do. Yeah, well, I can learn real quick that uh, uh, I couldn't do a job as, as well as, uh, as uh, whoever was doing it. I mean, the guy and the gal who was doing it, they know about it. So I could, they learned from each other and I learned from them. Right. Yeah, but your book is wonderful. You've got so many, so many wonderful um, little lessons in your book. And you talk about trusting your intuition and not your head, but your intuition. Not your heart, but your intuition. Well, that's uh, kind of hard to define, you know, in a, in a few words. But yeah, it's just feelings. It's also sort of educated feelings, I guess. And, uh, and it's uh, um, how the people, you know, you, you grow up with, you know, that uh, react. You just, you learn in lots of little ways. So, you know, a lot of little people that, you know, that are your family and your friends and your your, your work partners, your, you know, the company you work with, you just, you, you don't even remember all the little tidbits that go into what gives you a feeling. Yeah, one guy said, look, you seem to be able to look look around the corner and see what's what's around the corner. I said, well, I said, well actually I'm guessing. <laughs> sometimes I guess right, sometimes not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if many people knew that I didn't know that you owned the Bonanza restaurants and I can remember eating in the Bonanza when I was growing up in San Angelo, Texas and I think that um, uh, with Bonanza it wasn't something that you had set out to do own a restaurant chain but it ended up being a great venture for you yeah, it was uh, an accidental bonanza. <laughs> I, was a, I, I got it because I had guaranteed a friend's note, and it turned out that the friend had an offshore drilling rig, and the hurricane blew the rig away, and he couldn't pay off the notes to the bank, and I was a guarantor. So all of a sudden, I'm in the restaurant business. Mm -hmm. But, uh, <laughs> but you, made it, you made it very successful. 
Well, I, yeah, well, we had plenty of stumbles along the way. I mean, there were, we did things that didn't work, you know. We finally figured out, you know, how to make most things work. <laughs> and actually, we learned that the franchisees could do it better than a big company could. So we ultimately ended it. We had company-owned restaurants, and we had those that were owned by local owners who ran them. And we, uh, we finally learned the lesson that the local guys who would get in their family and everybody and have a local business could do it better than a big organization with a headquarters. So we ended up selling all the, all the restaurants, and, and we just collected a, a franchise or a royalty. And we did things like the, uh, educational things like how about a once a once a year trip to San Francisco and we can do something educational in the morning and people from San Angelo can <laughs> teach people from Oklahoma City how they do it and uh, so uh, and so we do yeah. something educational in the morning but in the afternoon uh, everybody who came to the conventions would go out and see Fisherman's Wharf or go, go across the Golden Gate Bridge or all the things that you can do in San Francisco. Well, I, I'm curious, curious if Lisa and Laurie, did you guys, did y'all grow up going into the Bonanzas? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. It was yeah. a favorite trip to go to Bonanza after church. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, yeah. uh, no, uh, Dad, um, also implemented the concept of a salad bar in Bonanza. So that was really cool because you care about healthy eating. Yeah, well, the big, the big thing we were doing was selling up. People like big, big steaks then. So the big right. thing we were doing was sell, you know, what we advertised was a yeah. steak, but we also said, hey, we need some green stuff, vegetable yeah. stuff, you know. Well, give people a lot of healthy choices. Yeah. That's how I like the baked potato and the salad bar. <laughs> <laughs> but I do remember that was one of the first. Bonanza was one of the first to bring in a salad bar. Yeah. So creating new ideas. And you talk about in your book how you looked at it as an adventure, right? So you guys really went after it as an adventure. Well, let's talk about, you know, you've had many, many successes in your career. And as an entrepreneur, you've tried lots of things. And we've got many entrepreneurs that are watching. And as an entrepreneur, you know that there could be failures along the way. And I know, you know, Datran was a company that you started. How did you know when it was time to fold it? Because as an entrepreneur, you want to just keep going and going. But how did you know you should fold it? I sort of learned that we should fold or it was folded. It wasn't, it wasn't something I wanted to, it wasn't a conclusion I wanted to come to. Yeah. And it was, a, um, but it was a, it was a time when there was a single telephone monopoly and it been put together for people to make voice telephone calls. Mm -hmm. And there was, that was done very well with what you call analog technology. But the computer was based on a different digital technology. And so um, it trying to send computer data over this old analog plant, it was too slow. It was full of errors. Um, and, and so the, I remember the, the summary of it in a talk I made to the Spring Joint Computer Conference in Atlantic City was the computer user has dialed into a busy signal. Mm -hmm. That's what it felt like if you were with a guy with a computer trying to talk to another computer, whether it was a, a block away or a thousand miles away. Can you remind me what time period that was for Daytran? Was it this, Was it in the 60s or the 70s? Well, we, we, we started in, in the late 60s, but it, it went over into the 70s. Okay. Mm -hmm. How did you learn? You mentioned that there was a telephone monopoly that you were going up against. How did you, when did you learn it was time to fold? Like as you were trying to move things along and you'd had some success in building the network, then there was a point where you knew you had to put the plug. Well, what, part of it was not just uh, uh, us uh, companies in it, you know, being AT&T, there was a, 
it was also um, the macroeconomic situation of the, of the whole nation, of the whole world. In the, in the 60s, people uh, loved new ideas and technology in Wall Street. They loved, you, could, you, could do, you could raise capital. But the 70s totally changed. You went from a, um, from a low level of inflation to a very high level of inflation. You, you went from home mortgage rates of 4% to paying 20% on your, on your home mortgage. I remember when a friend of mine in Colorado, his mortgage had a floating rate and it floated up to 20%. He, he had to sell his place in Colorado and move to Dallas to, uh, just because he, he couldn't pay the mortgage. I mean, there were a lot of tough times, and the cost of living was greater. It was, it was just, there, there were things that were bigger than us that we had to deal with, as well as the specific competitive thing. There was a massive power of a single, you know, uh, monopoly delivering the same, which actually maybe back in the 1800s, or early 1900s, it was good to give somebody a monopoly to kind of get phones going. It was like it had been good to get some people electricity service locally mm -hmm. by giving a Louisiana Power and Light, you know, the electricity monopoly. And later we dealt with that industry, but first mm -hmm. we dealt with the phone industry that was becoming the computer industry. Right. But you broke that monopoly up. Well, ultimately, but uh, when, when I finally realized I had to shut it down and lay off 300 of the best and the brightest telecommunications in the in the country, um, I realized that uh, um, you were going to need to change laws and rules, and uh, this wasn't easy. It would take a long time. I, uh, I remember asking the team of lawyers we have, uh, how long is this going to take? And uh, what, what is it going to cost? And, and, and um, how can, anyway, um, they ended up saying, well, it could take 10 years. We don't really know. It could be done in you know, seven or eight, or it could take 10 years or longer. And I made a deal with the lawyers, Bob Strauss and his firm, to work on a contingency fee. In other words, they'd get paid out of the winnings. They would get 28% of the winnings. But they said, you don't have to pay us a legal fee except out of the winnings, but you have to pay the out-of-pocket uh, costs. You've you got, you got to do a lot of Xeroxing of all these paper documents, a lot of stuff that's expensive, so you got to pay the out-of-pocket expenses. I said, how much are those? They said, they're a million dollars a year. So I said, I will spend a million dollars a year forever to get the right answer. <laughs> Wow. Well, thank goodness you did, because that completely changed the telecommunications industry. It, it totally did, too. It brought the cost of a phone call from a dollar down to a penny. I have a, I have a question for Dad. Um, hearing you talk about that experience, and did, did, you ref, did, you, did that experience help you when you were going to start Green Mountain Energy? Yeah, I did. It, uh, it, you had it, it told me from the beginning that this ain't going to be easy. Yes. And it's uh, and it's uh, and it's different in different states, and, and uh, so uh, um, it, um, that was that was a struggle too. Even though you'd had this prior experience dealing with the telephone monopoly, you still struggled with clean energy in the energy or the electric right monopoly. Right, but I. I thought it was something that needed to be done. Yeah. That, that, uh, there was climate change going on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, uh, our, uh, our slogan was, choose wisely. It's a small planet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, actually, we really get today. We're having extremes of cold and extremes of heat. But things are being done that are, that are helping solve the problem. Yeah. We had green energy. Yeah. 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 I'm curious. So, with with your Sterling Software Company, you built that company by acquisition. Did you? How did you know which companies to buy, or were there certain rules that you would keep in consideration when you go to buy a company? Were there certain things you looked for? Well, we had a little team of uh, Ann Sterling Williams and a couple of other guys. We actually spent two years 
looking at every little software company all over the country, trying to figure out what are the best little pieces to be. I mean, we spent three years, you could say, not buying anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we got to know a lot of people. We got to really understand a lot of it. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, so it was a kind of a like a, taking a period of education. So, Sam, as you look back on your life, what are the lessons that you've learned that people should take heed on? Gee, there's a million lessons. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to pick. Well, like what you were just saying about um, before you and your small team moved forward, you really educated yourselves in these different areas. Um, so you acquired knowledge, you did lots of research, you met with a lot of people and built relationships, <laughs> things like that. So that's yeah. something that I hear when you're talking about it. Yeah, well, that's the way that, that we, I or we as a team, you know, mm -hmm. sort of a way of le learning, you know, mm -hmm. people yeah. explain things to us. Yeah, that's the thing, Michelle, that um, David's told me about before, that he knows about dad is kind of what you're touching on, is that he'll go deep in learning about whatever the industry is, because he's so varied in the different experiences he's had in building businesses. Mm -hmm. So going deep in knowledge about it, he's just a voracious reader who loves to, you know, really get a good understanding of things um, before he moves ahead. And then um, finding good people to really know what they're doing, like that team you had, that putting a good team together. Mm -hmm. But then with your question about, you know, lessons, there's lots of lessons. And the, the other thing that David's mentioned is that dad's not want, one to really want to give a lot of advice, but if you sit down and have a conversation with him and ask questions, he'll share his experience with you. And from that, you get the lessons that he learned along the way. That's been really valuable. I found it interesting. He, he was around so many great men as well. Ross Perot, Right was a friend, um, and they were both building their companies at the same time. Uh, well, we were going to class together. We were, we were both at the Abbey Up Education Center. And when I first met Ross, me and Ross both, there was a, if you can imagine a printer plug board that is big as, like I got my arms around both my daughters. That, is that big and that square and it's full of, little electricity connections that are all different colors. But this is the this is the machine that only does the printing. And we were learning to hardwire uh, that printer board at the IBM Education Center. And we we'd have to carry him home at night to work on. <laughs> I, I found that very interesting. Did you know Sam Walton also? I did not really know Sam Walton personally. Uh, actually, the, uh, the uh, one guy I put in the book actually personally met Sam Walton, Michael Rouleau, mm -hmm. the, uh, and, and, and both of Walton uh, and Hong Kong. Hong Kong was a place you went to do uh, this, the buying from things made in China. And that was true of the, you know, the arts and crafts business of Michael, that Michael Rouleau was in really. It was true of Sam Walton. I mean, I mean, at Michael's, we learned from Sam Walton. Yeah. So, so did a lot of other retailers. Everybody's trying to trying to copy what Walmart's doing. Right. So, uh, uh, Michael happened to get on the same elevator with uh, uh, Sam Walton in Hong Kong, and uh, right after, and he asked, it was on a Saturday, so he asked Mr. Walton, "Would you spend some time talking to me?" Because uh, Michael wanted to learn from Sam Walton, and mm -hmm. so uh, at the end of the day. Michael realized that he and he and Walton had spent the whole day together, uh, and he hadn't learned anything. That, and Walton had drained Michael of everything he ever knew about retailing, and, 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 and I hadn't learned anything. <laughs> Michael. That's, a, that's a great story. Well, I know that you you referenced Sam Walton because you talk about how Sam would go into the stores and talk to the people and hear from the customers what they wanted. And, and you implemented that within Michael's stores, right? Right, right. Well, it was, uh, there was a, uh, 
I had read a lot about uh, what Walton had done, and uh, uh, he had started a, in a little five and dime store, just like we had a little five and dime store in Lake Providence, Louisiana. And Michael's got its start out of a five and ten cent store. It was the same kind of little things, but in, in Lake Providence, we go to town on on Saturday, and my dad go to the barber shop because that's where all the farmers are talking about the price of soybeans or cotton. And mom would go to the five and ten cent store to get kind of little a lot of little items, along with picking up groceries at Mr. Schwartz's store. So uh, they were uh, um, we we yeah, well Michael's beginnings was in the five and dime store just like uh, Walton's beginning. Uh, was in the five and dime store. Yeah. They both bought from a big warehouse company up in St. Louis, whose name I now forget. I think it was Butler Brothers. Right. And Lisa, there's a, there's a story in the book where you talk about how your dad took you to Michael and he said, Lisa, what do you see here? You want to- oh, yeah. I, he said, let's go for a drive. And we drive down Mockingbird Lane and he pulls into this parking lot and asks me, Lisa, what do you see? And I'm like, uh, an arts and crafts store? <laughs> and he said, it's a full parking lot. I see a full parking lot at this store. You know, he didn't see, it didn't really matter what the store was, I don't think. <laughs> Just like, there's a lot of people coming to this store. <laughs> Well, I couldn't understand most of them. I could understand framing a picture. Oh, he loves pictures, yeah. yeah we, I would take a picture to yeah. frame it and throw the wall. But there's a, uh, thousands of other products that yes. I have no idea what do you do with it. Yes, yes, yes. So, Sam, in your history with uh, all the businesses you were in, did you ever go out and raise capital? I had to raise capital from the very first company and then over and over again with the later companies. So. Mm-hmm. Right. Any advice, many of the entrepreneurs that are watching are all, there. many of them are out raising capital. Any words of wisdom there to share to, with them? Well, it, 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 it could be done in all sorts of ways and come from all sorts of sources. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't have any uh, simple rule to, to pass out. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Everybody's situation is different, you know. I know a rule. Experience <laughs> is that you have to get a lot of no's before you get that's, your yes. That's yes. what I was thinking. Right, so right. yeah, he'll even talk about like that big uh, infamous day um, when JFK oh, was JFK. shot. He said, "Dad had to go to to two banks, I believe, that day, or just one. You had three one big bank banks you were going to go. You're going to visit one this day, and you were going to go." get your no at a certain time so you can watch the, the presidential parade go by. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, and, right, right. Um, the motorcade. The motorcade. Yeah. And so, you know, he so he kind of knew, you never get just, you know, too down just because he got a no. In a sense, you knew you were that much closer to a yes. That's kind of what I... Right, no, that's right. Kind of, that's exactly yeah. right. Now, I, I had already been to the biggest bank in town and gotten a no, and I'd already been to the second biggest bank in town. <laughs> <laughs> Since the presidential <laughs> parade in downtown Dallas was scheduled for 12 noon, and I wanted to see, I wanted to see that. I scheduled my no meeting from the third biggest bank in town, so I go to get my no at 11, and I could see the parade at 12, and then I could start getting ready to work on the fourth biggest bank in town. Yeah. So, how did, how did, when did, what led up to getting a yes? You, you kind of approach these big banks. Well, they would all explain to me why, uh, you know, all the care, everything you had, you know, for a bank credit. And I knew we didn't have uh, yeah. the first thing on the tech list or the second thing on the tech list. Or so. so I was trying to, every time I would, uh, you know, have the conversation, I learned something else, some kind of problem needed to be solved mm-hmm. in this whole sphere of activity. Mm-hmm. And capital could come from different places. Yeah. And, and in different forms. Mm-hmm. that wouldn't be thought of as ordinary capital as a bank loan or a stock sale. You know? Right, right. So, Laurie, I'm curious, what was it like growing up in the household with your father? It's a very successful businessman. Well, it's he just seemed like a regular dad when we were kids <laughs> growing up. 
because we like play touch football in the front yard with the neighborhood kids and he you know every evening he was home reading the paper while we you know be playing he coached us softball he was a coach of our softball team in grade school so in a lot of ways we're just you know like a regular family but i do remember um at school as we got older someone asked are you rich because <laughs> we lived in this huge house on beverly drive but i didn't think of it wasn't really aware as children you're not really aware of that but i remember getting that question are you rich and i thought i don't know so i went home and we i asked dad dad are we rich and he said well you're rich in spirit <laughs> and so there was, there was never a big focus on like the money or the big you know victories per se but more just as us as individuals and to, and to you know do the best you can he was always as being twin daughters, dad was always just giving a sense that we could do anything we wanted in mm -hmm. our lives, yeah. to really taking off limits yeah. and not so much focusing on, you know, how much money, this or that, but, you know, what's your interest and, and pursue it. And then you can do anything you want, you know, so that's kind of what it was like. I had a similar um, feeling growing up just as being a girl and then a young woman. I always got the message from you, dad, that... I can do anything. I could be anything. I could do anything. And then, and when dad sits, when the table we're sitting at right now is the dining table that we sat at growing up in, uh, with dad. And he would tell stories about his mom and how strong she was and her mother. He has always had a lot of respect for women and their ability. And so I could see it in practice too, like at our family office the people in the lead positions were, were and are women. And um, he's, um, and in his businesses too, I see, I could see him in being very inclusive, which is more like a current thought today where people are kind of awakening to the idea that a diversity of perspectives is really beneficial. And dad was already practicing that in his work. So um, it really meant a lot to me, just that messaging that you were giving me. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, it was, you know. well, it was a joy to me to be able to coach your elementary <laughs> softball team. Because yeah. back then, dads could be coaches. And so, yeah. I, and so uh, uh, Larry was the lead off batter because she had a good eye and she could always get a walk on a ball and get a hit in your race. And Lisa batted in fourth place. She was a cleanup hitter. She'd yeah. take a big swing at it, you know. <laughs> and so she'd either knock them all in or she'd strike out. But either way, she'd learn from good lessons. <laughs> well, I, I feel like, Sam, you have always been ahead of the times. I mean, just hearing Lisa say that, you know, women were in the workforce very early on and in leadership positions with you, with your company. You also, you, you had such a knack of seeing the future. And you talk a lot of, or, or in the book, it talks about how history just continues to repeat itself. And you're a very much of a reader, as as Lisa said, or Laurie said, I'm not sure which. Um, so do you find yourself reading a lot nowadays, today? Well, I, 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 read, I read a good bit, and I read you know, yeah, I, 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 different things. And I, I have to acknowledge I watch it. I watch a lot of movies with captions on them. <laughs> the thing about working on the book, Michelle, was that we would be talking about one of his businesses and the concept or something and that we'd come over, but Dad would have just seen something in the paper or seen it in the news. He said, well, that's... And he would compare it to something that he'd done, you know, way back when. Decades before, yeah. And so that's what kind of brought out that then and now section is that some of these, con like you said, history repeats itself. So those concepts, he's like, oh, that's just like when this happened at this company. And so that, that's why we included that in the book. Yeah. You know, you named, uh, you all named the company, the investment company, Maverick. And you've been such a maverick throughout your whole career. I'm just curious, Lisa Murray, did you realize that your father was such a maverick growing up? No. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, from the monot breaking up the monopoly with AT and T, and then I thought it was very interesting that he sold the company to AT and T later, which was really interesting. 
Um, yeah, we but he would. I was not so aware of that growing up, you know, and even in, um, even as an adult, um, some of the wonderful things that he would do, we, we might learn about it in the newspaper, mm -hmm. you know, like a lot of his philanthropy, uh, I'd read about it in the paper because he'd just kind of quietly go about, well, I guess not quiet if it's in the paper, right? But, <laughs> but he'd go about, or he'd be thinking and going about his work and not, not so much, you know, bragging in advance, you know, I mean, he, he does tell his story and, and a lot of them are, but he very much has a bright view and rose and not, I don't say rose colored glasses, but it, that positive perspective on, on his whole history. Um, but he doesn't really talk a lot about it in advance of mm -hmm. it happening. Yeah. I remember him talking about some of the things he was doing, but not really making the connection that it was a big deal. In fact, most of the time I'd be like, how, how can you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I remember you talking about, um, this may have been in UCC days, and you're talking about laying a cable across the ocean from America over to Europe. Yeah. And I was like, the ocean's so big. That can't be possible. <laughs> Where does it go? What about the fish? What about the boats? Like all these, I had all these doubts about, you can't really do that. And he's like and explaining that it's fiber optics. And I'm like, what is that? It just, I just wasn't picking up on what it was until later looking back on it and the innovation of it. Yeah. yeah. Well, the technologies were changing. I mean, the telephone pole, you had a pole in the ground and you had wires or ran across, but then there were other things. What other ways you could send messages? Well, One of them was that cable under the sea, one was a satellite you could yeah, put up in the sky, mm -hmm. and, and, and each one of those bunches of how do you carry a message, whether it's a voice message or a data message, there were different kinds of hardware mm -hmm. and uh, different ways to do it, and it, uh, it, uh, it uh, was changing, you know, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and it's changing today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have left such a legacy. It's amazing all that you have touched, Sam. And you're such a treasure for Dallas, Texas, um, and a treasure for this country. And I just want to say thank you for all that you have done. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And I want to make sure that everyone knows about the book. So, um, we're going to, we have a slide of the book. Perfect. I love that picture. It's a great picture. Do people still call you Bubba? Yeah. People still call you Bubba? Yeah, well, a few, yeah. But a... I wish that were your grandpa name. I was yeah. telling the kids that. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a growing up name. It's a small town, a lot of family, and uh, and uh, actually, uh, going up, you know, through first grade through twelfth grade, uh, there were teachers who wanted me to write my real name, and I'd have to pick to well, I put Evans Wiley on the paper sometimes. That was my middle name, and that was my mom's name. My first name was Samuel, you know. And so, but. Most of the grades I could put Bubba on the place. And uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, <clears throat> actually, Andrew just searched up an old Del High Dispatch newspaper from somewhere on the web. I don't know where he is. <laughs> but, it, but it's my dad writing play by play stories of the football team. And he, he, he comes down to one where Bubba Wiley makes the tackle. It's a four yard loss for the Lake Providence Panthers. You know? mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's impressive that, 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 I mean, my dad, the editor, could, could, could do work like that, you know. And we were a little country town, but he would take the summaries of the stories and send them to the big newspapers in the big cities. And then you have the big cities in New Orleans yes. and uh, Baton Rouge, you know, and, and uh, Freeport, which is not what you think of if you're in L.A. and Dallas. But, mm -hmm. But those those were the big cities where we lived in Delhi, mm -hmm. and so and Delhi was a crossroads town. We're right there where the railroad had been built through. We were a railroad stop, 
And then they built a, uh, an interstate highway from Georgia that ran through Delhi and it ran through Dallas and went all the way to Santa Monica, California. And uh, so we figured we were right in the heart of America. And that was kind of a farm road that went north and south. And even though it was population 3,000, we were at the crossroads of America. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's no doubt that your upbringing played a big role of your success, it seems like. And um, I want to say personally, I, I appreciate you making this time happen today. And Laurie and Lisa, thank you all both for making this happen today, too. And Evan, I don't know where, if he's still around, but he's still here. 